So hi everybody, my name is Tom McGovern, I'm with Databricks. Um, I assume everyone here knows who Databricks is at some level. Uh, but real quick, we do three things. We write Spark, uh, contribute about 75 to 80% of the code to Spark. Uh, we train on Spark, so we can come to your office and, and train your team on Spark, even if you're running on-prem or in the cloud, it doesn't matter to us, we, we uh, work essentially on pure Apache Spark. And then we have a cloud-based data platform. So if you are interested in using the cloud to work in a Spark environment, uh, you might um, be interested to hear how we can uh, you know, provide services and support you around those, those areas. So good evening, I'm Nick Afshartis. I'm from the um, WB Analyst Platform team at WB. Um, we're housed in the, um, the Turbine Game Studio in Nido. Um, so we live in the Turbine Game Studio, but we're actually uh, a team that provides a horizontal service across the uh, suite of um, game studios that WB um, owns. So the main storylines that I'm going to talk about are the challenges we had when we deployed our first um, Spark streaming app into production last summer, and how we um, reworked the pipeline to address those, those challenges. I'm going to try not to throw around any acronyms that people may not be familiar with, so I'm just going to touch on some of those different things we're using in our stack. Um, so we're in the Amazon Cloud um, using um, AWS EMR. Um, we use um, Apache Avro for sending data over the wire. Um, of course, Spark um, and Kafka for streaming data um, into, um, into Spark streaming. For data warehouses, um, more recently, we're using um, Amazon Redshift. Um, um, interesting side note this week is that um, Amazon just announced a few days ago a service called Spectrum integrated with Redshift that allows um, you to write queries that query um, data not only in native Redshift, but also data sitting in S3 and RK or for text format. So that's kind of an attractive thing for us because we have existing data in Redshift. And now if we use this service, we can join data um, in both S3, S3 and Russia. Um, and we also have a, a batch pipeline um, that's a little bit older that uses Vertica. Um, and we use these um, data warehouses because they're column stores providing very good query performance um, over large data sets. And our, and our analysts make very extensive use of, of SQL. Um, just a, a quick overview of, of Kafka. Um, we have producers sending messages into topics. Topics can be split up into partitions for scale scalability. On the other side, consumers um, consume from one or more topics. And within a partition, a message is identified by its offset within that partition. Um, a message has an optional key and a value. Um, in the context of a game, the, the key is typically something that's identified with the user. So if a player is playing, playing a game, um, that user ID is the key, and then when the data uh, lands um, in, our, in our pipeline into Kafka, the ordering of events is then preserved because all of the, the data for a particular player will be guaranteed to land into the same Kafka um, partition. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the game data that we're ingesting. Um, so games are instrumented to send out um, interesting events. Um, the volume varies quite a bit depending on whether it's a mobile game at the lower end of the, the volume spectrum, spectrum um, compared to a big blaster console game. Um, console games have <coughs> much more bandwidth um, than the mobile games. Um, games are instrumented to send out um, various different types of events. So some examples are you know, a session begins, session ends, um, an attack event if it's a fighting game, and it varies um, by game and how many different um, types of events uh, are, are instrumented. Um, we use the data in, in a few different ways. The game teams like to integrate with the platform early in the development cycle. That's kind of a feedback loop that helps guide um, the development process of the game. It's also used for basic reporting and some more advanced use cases like decreasing player churn. They use the data to try and identify reasons for why players actually will drop out and stop playing a game. And also, if it's a, um, it's a free-to-play game, uh, such as mobile games, they'll use the data to try 
try to uh, monetize as much as possible using, using the, uh, the data. Um, so as I mentioned, we have two different pipelines. We have an older batch pipeline and our newer Spark um, screaming pipeline. Um, so some basic differences are, like a lot of people, we came from using MapReduce and moved to, to using Spark. And also in the batch pipeline, we're ingesting JSON as opposed to um, ingesting Avro in, in the Spark pipeline. So that's also a fundamental difference, and I think it's, it's a nice improvement. Because before we had to rely on, on type inference, but now with, with Avro, we have this kind of well-defined type contract between the game side and the analytics platform side, and that gives us a lot of control on how types are mapped um, from the game side into corresponding types um, in Amazon Redshift. So we actually have a config file where we map the two worlds, Avro types to Redshift types, and we can actually deploy different config files and do customer-specific type mappings. So that gives us a lot of control and, and provides a, a nice kind of interface be, between uh, the two worlds. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on the, um, the Spark pipeline. Um, regarding Spark versions, we're a little, we've been a little bit behind using Spark 1.5.2, but we're in the process of now rolling out a release that's compiled against Spark 2.0.2. Um, I was looking at 2.1 and doing some load testing, and then I ran into this deadlock issue bug um, under load. And so this is um, a known um, issue that affects specifically Spark 2.1. I was about to file another defect in the, um, in the Spark Jira. There's actually a few duplicates of this issue. But what saved me was that in the Spark UI, we went to, um, if you go to the Executors tab, you can take a thread dump of an executor. So we did that, we got the stack trace, and we matched it up with the stack trace in this um, known bug, and that saved us from creating yet another duplicate bug in, in the Spark Jira. Um, so I'll go into how uh, data actually is ingested into the pipeline. So there are a few different steps that um, game teams um, go through. Uh, feel free to, to ask questions as I'm going through this. We can, we can make this interactive if anything's not, not clear. Um, the first step um, that a game team does is they register an Avro schema by making a call to a um, schema registry. And when they do that, um, a few things happen. They, they get back um, in the return, they get back a hash um, of that schema that's you know, based on the content or, or field definitions of that schema. And that registration <coughs> process also triggers a backend process which will go ahead and either create or alter the corresponding table in, in Amazon Redshift. Um, the hash is based on the field on the field definition, so if they were to send, let's say, a modified version of that same schema by changing um, you know, a type of a, in a field definition or by adding a new field, then they would get back a different hash, or which would be um, a new version of that event. So they can evolve the, the schemas um, that they're working with, um, and that will trigger corresponding updates um, on the Redshift side. Um, so after they get the schema hash, they can then send the data into um, a service we call an event ingestion. So they can send um, a packet um, that includes the data and, and the schema hash. And here's um, a diagram of the entire flow. So the schema's been registered, they send to the ingestion endpoint. Um, the ingestion service will validate that the, that the hash is valid, valid and has been previously registered. And then it goes and sends the, the data into, into Kafka. Um, downstream, we're consuming using Spark Streaming. Um, so the streaming job will aggregate um, the, the event data by type. So after deserializing the Avro, it groups the events by type and then writes files um, into S3. And then we'll make um, a connection to Amazon Redshift to run a copy command, which will copy the data from S3 into Redshift. How big are the batches, and do they change based on game? The, the batch interval? Yes. We've been pretty constant at three minutes. For some reason, that's kind of been a sweet spot for us. Um, and we haven't really um, you know, moved it at all from Um, 
Since we're going to be kind of delving into the, process, the challenge of streaming data into Redshift, I want, I want to look more closely at uh, the copy command. Um, so we use the copy because it's uh, the optimal way of loading data into Redshift. And to illustrate with an example, if we have um, a database table in Redshift and a car corresponding file in S3 uh, that's delimited, um, the default is the pipe character. Then we can execute copy, which is a SQL statement against Redshift that says copy into this table um, this, using this data file in S3. So here we're copying into a table called person, in, which is in the, um, in the public schema. I'll just pause for a second if there are any, any questions. So looking again at the picture of, of the pipeline, um, this is the architecture we initially deployed last summer when we first uh, went live with the game. And, and pretty soon we realized that we had some, some big challenges. Um, so looking at the different uh, components, if we look at Redshift, it's really designed um, for doing you know, heavy lifting, big data loads, but not a highly concurrent workload. Whereas coming through Kafka into Spark Streaming, we have an inherently concurrent workload because we could have up to 70 different event types, which means that we could be writing into S3 that many files and then asking Redshift to run that many concurrent copies. So, so we realized early on that we, had, that we were facing an impedance mismatch between a workload that's being processed in Spark and being sent down, downstream to Redshift. And we had to scramble to kind of stabilize the um, the streaming job, and it was kind of you know, not very pretty because we were making changes on the Sparks side to tune it to optimize and make sure that we uh, were loading Redshift in, in the optimal way. So looking back on it, our, our first production deployment was kind of, like a, uh, kind of like a big car accident waiting to happen. So we have this impedance mismatch uh, and there are other you know, challenges as well. You know, latency on the Redshift side can vary because there are other workloads competing with um, the Spark streaming job. And there's also a weekly maintenance that Amazon does. Um, some of Amazon's services have zero, zero downtime patching, but Redshift has a weekly maintenance, so the database it may go away you know, during that window. We've also had hardware crashes in some of our clusters. So. We really needed to make our, our loading process um, more tolerant. Um, and I'm going to go into next um, how we kind of redesigned our pipeline to, to meet these challenges. Um, so we you know, realized that we had to kind of decouple and sever the connection between Spark and Redshift and make uh, the loading process um, all tolerant. So at a high level, we just want to have Spark writing to, to S3, and then we'll create these, these copy tasks, these downstream processing tasks, and you know, insert these tasks into, into Kafka, and then have a new loader uh, process uh, process the, the, these tasks. So that's the, the high level um, solution, and we considered a few different ways of, of achieving this. So for consuming, we thought about uh, writing a second Spark streaming job. And also, we consider building what I would call a more lightweight consumer, you know, a, a, a consumer that was more focused on just consuming from Kafka and running these copy tasks without all of the um, extra data processing API that Spark brings to the table. And we had a fairly lively date, debate about this and had a hard time kind of achieving consensus. Um, I'll just pause for a second if anybody, if anybody has an opinion or wants to weigh in on which approach they think makes more sense. Go ahead. I was curious, did, did you guys consider using the Databricks published Redshift loader? They have, a, I forget, it's like a data source implementation that lets you save a data frame directly to Redshift. But in the background, what it's doing is what you guys are doing roughly, which is saving to S3 right. and issuing a copy command, except they've abstracted away, so you can use the familiar data frame dot write dot, you know, whatever, redshift. 
Do you guys look at that at all in this picture? How, how long ago did that come out? It's been out, uh, I mean, at least a year, maybe, maybe longer. But okay. I, I don't know how it fits in with this picture. Right. But it sounds like maybe you guys didn't consider that. I think I've heard of, it, heard of it, but there may have been a reason why we didn't. It might be one issue. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's compatible with one five. That's, that's a good point. But we also have behind the scenes the schema evolution process, um, so that might have been a reason why um, we couldn't use something like that. I'd have to look at it again more, more closely. Is the streaming RDDs? It's not structured, is it? No, this is, we're not on structured streaming yeah. Yeah. because we've been on one before. Oh, sure. Thank you. So we decided to go with the, the second option, um, given the fact that Redshift is really doing all the work. It doesn't really make sense to have Spark run these copy commands uh, because you're not really utilizing the, the resources of the Spark customer. Uh, so we looked at different APIs for, for building this Redshift loading process. I first looked on the Kafka website and saw pages of code for writing a consumer and was kind of you know, steered away from that. And then I fell on uh, this API called um, Reactive Kafka. And it's a very high level consumer API where in a few lines of code you can write um, a streaming consumer consuming uh, from Kafka. And it sits on top of Akka Streams and then Akka is kind of the engine underneath that handles the, the execution of, of the streams. So I'll go through starting from Akka and working up, uh, just touching on, on these different layers. So ACA is a model of concurrent computation um, where you have these actors which are entities with a built-in uh, queue, sometimes also called a mailbox. And, and, and Spark used to use ACA under the hood, but now I believe it's not using um, ACA underneath. Um, so these actors are single-threaded entities that communicate via asynchronous message passing. Um, they don't use shared memory, so you uh, don't have to deal with some of the typical problems in concurrent programming, like uh, race conditions on, on shared variables. Um, the framework also has some nice features with regards to um, distribution over a cluster and also fault tolerance. But even though ACA is a very nice concurrent um, programming framework, it's still hard to, to implement stream processing on top of that and deal with um, issues like back pressure, slowing down parts of a stream when other parts of the stream um, that are before are, are executing and processing messages faster, and also making the stream processing fall tolerant. So that's kind of the motivation for ACA streams, is that you can um, have this, this DSL, domain-specific language, where you can focus on um, implementing the stream processing and not have to worry about um, all this, all this other plumbing that goes with um, doing screen processing. Um, these are the main components of, of the uh, streams DSL. So we have sources, which are generators of, of stream elements. Um, there are flows that can sit um, in between that are transformers. And then at the end, we have um, sinks, which are the terminal endpoints of, of the stream. Here's an example. This is Scala code. So the supported languages are Scala and Java. So here we could create a source that emits um, the numbers one and two, and then we apply a map function to it. So we'll print out the elements um, one and two. Uh, but even with this simple example, there's a couple of um, uh, subtle um, points to, to the stream example. So first, the the stream code is not executed by the calling thread. So depending on timing <coughs> issues, you may or may not actually see the output um, of, of this program. And another kind of subtle point is that nothing actually happens until some variant of the run method is called, which is kind of nice because you can, um, you can kind of set up the stream, uh, the stream code, and it acts as kind of a specification, but no execution happens until you invoke the, um, the run method. What is the uh, ignore method? That's the, that's the terminal endpoint of the stream. All streams end with, with a sync. And in this case, we're just 
using sync.ignore, which doesn't do anything. So there are other types of syncs which actually do something, uh, but this in this small example, we don't, really need, we don't need a sync to, to do anything. Um, so now that we have Aqua Streams, a reactive Kafka stream is just a specific type of, of Aqua Stream, where, where the stream elements are, are coming from, from Kafka. Um, and reactive Kafka has a supported uh, version since uh, Kafka.10. Um, so in a few steps, you can just set up um, reactive Kafka consumer, first by setting up a config object where we instantiate an actor system, and then we create the con consumer settings object by passing in deserializers for the key and value, uh, and then specifying the, the Kafka endpoint and the consumer group label. Um, in Kafka, uh, it's the group label that identifies the consumer, so consumers can act independently with their own label, or they can share the load by using the same uh, group label. Then after setting up the config, we can call con consumer.plain source, which is one of the ways of um, creating a source in reactive Kafka. And we pass in the config object the topic that we're subscribing to, and then we can apply a map like before to print out the, uh, the messages in the, in the stream. So plain source constructs um, a source object where the source, in this case, is emitting stream elements from Kafka. Um, and the, the message um, variable in, in this example has type um, consumer record, which is from the, the Kafka.10 API. Um, so if you're consuming using a Kafka.10 consumer, the, the stream elements have type um, consumer record. And you can see the same thing in the Spark uh, streaming API too, if you're using the, the .10 integration um, API. Um, some notes about back pressure. Uh, that kicks in when some part of the stream is, you can't keep up with um, an upstream part. So that's when back pressure kicks in. And we saw in the examples where we were using the, the map um, function to process messages. But if we were to um, invoke any asynchronous operations within map, then that would kind of bypass the back, the back pressure mechanism because then the framework doesn't know when those asynchronous operations actually complete. So there are different hooks in the API, in this case map async, that you would use if you were launching um, a feature or asynchronous operation during the course of a screen processing. So now that we have these nice APIs, you know, here's how we revise the architecture to incorporate um, reactive Kafka. So as before, we send the data into Kafka to consume using Spark, but now Spark only writes to S3 and, and the connection with, with Redshift is, has been severed. It's also going to emit uh, copy tasks onto a second Kafka topic. And that's going to be consumed by what we call the Redshift Loader, built using Reactive Kafka. So it's using a combination of um, Reactive Kafka for consuming, and also Akka, so that's the, um, the hierarchy inside the circle. So it's the Akka hierarchy of, of a master and a set of workers. So the, the workers will make connections to Redshift to run the copy command to um, copy the data from S3 and Redshift. I don't know if you're going to get this or if I missed it, but what is the mechanism by which Redshift communicates back up that I'm not able to keep up with your copy request slow down? How does that signal get sent? That's the back pressure mechanism, right? Or did I misunderstand that? So the, the copy is, is a synchronous operation or a transaction. So when you execute the copy, it doesn't return until, until it's completed. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, to, to, so to know, I think maybe maybe this will answer your, your question. So how do we know if we're slowing down and that we can't keep up in the pipeline with the rate of data that's coming out? Yeah. Uh, so to address that, we actually we do end-to-end -end monitoring, and we send test data into the pipeline. And when things slow down, we'll get alerts that um, things are, that we have a problem that we need to look at. 
So if you have a, a very large Spark cluster um, <coughs> writing out, let's say, all 70 events, files for all 70 events uh, in, in batches, successive batches, you're going to get you know, successive batches of 70 requests to copy the data into that queue. Right. And Redshift will start processing them. If Redshift is unable to do all those concurrent loads, which is why you built this, this thing in the first place, your, your monitoring system is the one that will see that the rate is slowing down right. and somehow communicate that to, uh, I guess, which component? Where, where, where is the place where you control the rate of data? Is it that initial event ingestion <coughs> service that, that slows things down? Well, we don't really have kind of a choice where we can slow things down. I mean, the games that are out there, people are playing the games, the data comes in, the volume that is where, you know, that it's going to be sent at. We need to really keep up with that volume. So when we size our, our clusters in our Redshift cluster, we need to size our Redshift cluster so that we can more, that more than keep up with the rate at which data is coming in. Because Redshift could go down for a day if you have you know, that happen, or we could have an outage. And we, when we bring a loading process back online, we've got to be able to catch up. So on a regular, kind of happy path, we need to be able to have the power to, to do more than keep up. So if, it went, if the redshift went down, then the, the data would pile up in S3 buckets, right? It would sit in S3 yeah. until the loader came back online, yeah. and then the loader would have to catch up. So S3 is a buffer, a big buffer. But S3 and, and Kafka are both, yeah. both buffers. Okay. And there are better buffers than Spark Stream. Yeah. They're better to buff with than the streaming, because the streaming is much more <coughs> Well, we want to have the data in a safe place. So the data is safe in Kafka. The tasks in both the data are safe in Kafka because it lives there until the end of the retention period. So we keep our data in Kafka for 30 days. Um, and then anything that lands in S3 you know, sits there and sits there forever. Uh, Business use case for the data available in Redshift as quickly as possible. Was, was that uh, try to understand why do we have to load data that is sitting on S3? Uh, like we, we, we could have easily done a batch load of data sitting in S3 into Redshift. Uh, but was it a business use case to have the data available in Redshift as it is getting generated or as quickly as possible? Uh, so that people can analyze it. Was that the use case in this scenario? So, so right now, we actually we have work in development to save <coughs> files in Parquet format, but that's not been done in the pipelines that we've deployed. <coughs> so all our customers are actually looking at Redshift, and these files that we're saving in S3 are just really for the purpose of loading Redshift. Uh, my question is, uh, was it absolutely necessary for us to if, if file one goes to S3, it has to go to the database uh, before file two is getting so the redshift load could have been could have, could have happened asynchronously at a batch time later. Uh, was it a business use case to get it into redshift as quickly as possible for analytics? That's what my question is. The analysts like to see the data as soon as possible, especially while the game is under development, because then that gives them a, a faster kind of feedback loop. Okay. Um, so it kind of, it's, it's good to have the real-time data because, it, you know, people can, you know, when, when the game developers are working, it gives them a faster feedback loop. Okay. So Richard's main uh, data store is S3, so you have two copies in, the Spark, and then the, the copy of S3 that's been loaded into Redshift. Redshift's data, native data store is S3. Right, it uses S3. Is it just a or for the loading process, we're using S3. But do, doesn't Redshift store its data in S3 as well? No, we're, this, the data that we're loading into Redshift is, in the actual, is being stored in the Redshift cluster. Redshift has storage where, where the data lands on the new load Redshift. So it's a cluster, but it is on S3. No, I don't think it is. Good. No, no. I mean, with this new oh, with, with the new service they just announced this week, they have the capability to read data and query data in S3. But the data that we're looking at here is not in. It's loaded from S3, but once it's in Redshift, it's an actual 
cluster store in, in Russia. Um, so if you're only using S3 for buffer and you're happy with Kafka as a buffer, why isn't the Spark stream just loading directly to Russia? Not even using S3 in the first place? Because Redshift is optimized for loading from S3. So that's more performance? Yeah, for, for, for performance. I think that's the reason why that Databricks library I mentioned, even even if you were to directly save from Spark into Redshift using that library, all it does in the background is save to S3 and then tell Redshift to copy from S3. Because Amazon designed Redshift to load data so amazingly fast yeah. from S3, and all the other ways of loading data are, are I mean, 10 times or more slower. <coughs> Yeah, so maybe under the covers it's going to be the exact same. No, that's exactly what it does. Yeah. It's, it's right there in the reading, yeah. This is mostly out of curiosity. We're kind of going back to this question, but how fast do the analysts like, look at this data to have the developers on it? I'm like, sorry, how quickly do Yeah, how quickly do, like, once this goes into Redshift, how quickly do people look at it? I mean, it really varies based on where things are in the life cycle of the game. The yep. game developers look at it all the time, so they'll yeah. notice you know, they'll notice right away if data is not landing in Redshift. Mm -hmm. so whereas, whereas once the game is live, you know, you know, people will look at dashboards periodically, but as the game gets older, people will refer to the data less and less. So it kind of just depends where we are in the life cycle of, of the game. Do you think it would make sense to uh, change change it slightly so that you did like less loads into Redshift as time gone? went on for certain games or something like that, or maybe it doesn't matter? Definitely as games get older, kind of the, um, the criticality of the data mm -hmm. you know, decreases, and we'll do things like, you know, turn off you know, some of the events, so not all the events are being loaded, because, you know, cost is a very big factor that's always being considered, you know, when, when we store data, because we you know, pay for it in different ways. So I'm going to keep going and we can take a few more questions at, at the end. Okay. So we achieved kind of one of the goals. We decoupled <coughs> and protected Spark from Redshift by severing the connection. But we had one other goal, which was to make the loading process, um, <coughs> excuse me, fault tolerant. And to, to kind of achieve that, we can look at the, the cluster status, which is displayed on, on the um, Redshift console. And we can also get that status programmatically using the, um, the SDK. So with that in mind, we'll implement a health check against Redshift. And when the cluster is available, we'll be in a consuming state where we're you know, consuming these copies from Kafka. And if we detect that redshift goes down, then we'll use a streams call to shut down consuming. We'll shut down consuming and stop uh, the stream execution. So it's kind of like what a load balancer would do with the nodes in a pool that it was um, balancing requests against. And another thing uh, we implemented was just testing very frequently the database connections. And one thing I found is that you can't rely on the JDBC um, driver to actually know when the database is gone. So we'll run test queries before actually doing a copy to make sure that the connection is, is still alive. Um, <clears throat> just a few notes about transactions. Um, with auto commit enabled, each copy runs as a separate transaction, which is not optimal because Redshift has a single threaded commit queue. So we'll get better throughput by batching copies and running a few concurrent transactions um, with these batches. Uh, we have to be careful though because of deadlock, because if we have multiple copies and concurrent transactions, um, we could get a deadlock and Redshift will detect that cycle and return and fail one of the transactions. So just to illustrate, if we have two transactions running against two tables, and then in the second step, they each try to copy to the table that the other transaction has locked. And we'll have deadlock because now they're each waiting for um, a lock on a table that's held by the other transaction. Um, and there are a few different ways to avoid this. Um, the current loader hashes using the table name to the worker, so all the 
copies for the same table go to the same worker, and that way you don't have um, these conflicts. Or we could use the al alternatively just um, sorting the copies by table name within, within a transaction so that each transaction tries to, to get a lock on a table in exactly the, um, the same order. So what did we learn from all this? Uh, some are new lessons, some are learns that we, lessons that we've learned over and over again. Um, we learned that you know, Spark is a great API for, for data processing, but in the course of um, you know, running copies, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense for Spark to be running these copies, especially since the data is persisted once into S3. It doesn't make sense to pay the price of persisting it again into Redshift when it's already saved in S3 during the, um, the Spark micro-batch. Um, we learned a lot about different dependencies that fail. Um, we learned a lot during load testing where we initially just focused on load volume and we got kind of surprised closer to that production deployment last, last summer because during the course of doing um, successive load tests, we saw a regression in that kind of surprised us because under the same event number of events per second we saw we were seeing regression in, in later load tests and what happened was the game teams had been adding more events to the game over time and then that resulted in more files in S3 and then hence more concurrent copies against Redshift and then so Redshift was slowing down and others slowing down the processing on the Spark side and causing us um, some headaches. Uh, we've learned a lot about monitoring and that you need to monitor not only kind of individual components and services, which we do when we monitor the loader, but how do you send out a, heart, a heartbeat? So if it dies, we know that it's gone down. But we've also learned that we have much more confidence that the whole pipeline is working once we started sending in kind of test events from the very first endpoint that our, that our game clients use and just monitoring the flow through the pipeline, looking at S3, looking at Redshift, and then triggering an alert if something isn't landing um, in the right place when it should, and that's really given us a lot more confidence in the, um, in the pipeline. And we did that by taking our, our QA framework that runs our daily um, integration tests and just kind of repurposing it a little, a little bit so that it's also used for monitoring in addition to, um, to QA. Um, if I had kind of the luxury of a lot more time to spend on this, I would look at using Akka Persistence, which is a persistence layer that, that can back, back Akka in case of um, process crashes. I would use more of the um, reactive Kafka API as I learned over time, some more of its um, features. So for instance, I, I use Akka actors, actors to do um, some buffering and batching to create batches of, of copies for, to run a transaction. And Reactive Kafka actually has a method that will help, that will form batches for you, kind of in the same way that Spark Streaming does. So I could have written a, a little less code using more of the, um, the Reactive Kafka API. Um, just one final related note: with Kafka.10, Kafka also has the Streaming API, okay. and the API looks very similar to Reactive Kafka. Um, so I haven't used that at all. I've looked on the website, and if you look at the code examples, it's very similar to the Reactive Kafka API. Um, I guess I would just note that if you're using Akka, Reactive Kafka has some hooks in it in the API to tie in actors. So if you're going to be also using actors, it, may, it probably makes more sense to look at Reactive Kafka. Um, um, so I'm putting this as kind of an, an appendix that's not complete yet, but in the final deck, I'm going to have all the package imports for the code examples that I showed previously so, you, so that anybody who wants to look at it would have a complete example that would be able to compile and run. Um, so I hope this has been um, informative and can have you know, final uh, any other questions. And just one more question. Uh, uh, what was the uh, uh, choices? What was the what made you not use the say uh, the Kinesis engine that uh, Amazon provides for streaming versus Kafka? Why why aren't we using Kinesis? Why not Kinesis? Amazon would love for us to use Kinesis. Um, they, they keep pitching us that to us all the time. Um, so the decision to use Kafka goes actually years back. Um, so actually, I wasn't. 
in the group when that decision was made. So I, I'm not sure where Kinesis was in its life cycle at that point, but um, that decision to use Kafka kind of predates my involvement, involvement with uh, the project. Do you have any opinions on, on that as a designer? Kafka versus Kinesis? Um, I'm not sure we could do everything that we're doing with this pipeline using Kinesis. I would have to look more closely at, at the API. Um, um, one question. In terms of the red schema registry, what do you use to register your schemas? What do you keep from schemas? It's actually a service that um, a team at the Turbine Studio built in-house. So the event ingestion and the schema registry were, were built in-house. Are you using a Confluence uh, version of Kafka? Because they seem to have them now. Yeah, I've seen yeah, open source okay. domain schema registries. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure if they were available when, when the, these services were initially built. Uh, um, yeah, these were built in-house. In okay. Yeah. I have another question. Sure. So when you got to the point where you had these two options for either making a lightweight thing that talked to the ship and consume, or doing the Spark streaming, making another Spark streaming uh, app there. So I'm kind of curious, what were the uh, arguments for making another Spark streaming application? Um, so one of the arguments was that you know Spark you know does the batching for you, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a, a nice Thing and you know, some people thought it would just be really easy to set up and do to um, you know to build the consumer using Spark streaming. So I was, as you might be able to tell, on the opposing side of that of that argument. And I, I just think that you know you are not really using the API, and there's you know quite a few configuration settings that go into tuning a Spark um, application. Um, and I I just thought that wasn't the right tool for. Did you do cost analysis of Spark job versus the Akka builder? In, in terms of performance? Or? No, cost. Cost? Yeah. It, it, it sounds to me like from operations point, it's easier to just maintain Spark infrastructure and the ecosystem versus in your case you have to maintain Spark and this lightweight Akka I guess, but I mean, using these very high-level kind of declarative APIs, it's, it's not a lot of code to maintain. But it's, so, a it's a different ecosystem, right? Yeah, it, it is. But I, I, don't, yeah, I haven't seen it as really um, kind of a big cost of ownership and, and using this specific I would assume it's, it costs less to run this type of yeah, we actually run it on the EMR master node where we launched the Spark job too. So that's kind of another, I think, nice advantage of that. You know, we get more confusing to be running multiple Spark jobs you know, for the same environment. Now we just have a single Spark job and then this other kind of just lightweight job or process. One more, question. one more question that I can hang out with. Uh, is vendor lock-in to AWS a concern for you guys? I don't know if I'm at the point about the you know, look at your Kinesis. Is that a concern for your team at Kinesis? I, I, think, I think it's a concern, but at this point, we're you know, pretty far along. Then it would be very hard to switch to, to a different cloud. Um, but I think that's one reason I would rather kind of stay on Kafka as opposed to being with Kinesis, for sure. Okay, well, thank you, Nick. There's no rush on leaving the place. I think we can hang out here. Nick, we didn't have